So now that we've got sponges out of the way, the simplest, least complex of all animals, we're now going to shift gears and still stay on the invertebrate side of the story of Kingdom Animalia, but now we're going to actually focus on those that have true tissues, those that have true organs uh, also. Now, in order to establish this, I think a good strategy is to start from the very beginning, the first thing that all animals at one point came from, and then continue to subordinate, continue to detail where we are and how we get to the next phylum of study. You'll see what I mean by this when we start by entitling uh, this first flowchart the idea that this is going to start from an ancestral protist. Okay, Why an ancestral protist? Well, this is because that ancestral protist was the single common ancestor, CA for common ancestor, of all animals. So that's going to be the top of every flowchart, essentially. So now, another way some people like to call this is uh, the LUCA, the last universal common ancestor of all animals, was an ancestral protist called the coanoflagellate. It was a flagellated protist. All the things mean that they all mean the same thing. Now, the next step was either to have true tissue or not true tissue, as we established before. So we already did metazoa. We already covered that in our previous video. Why? Because under metazoa was what? Periphera, right? And that's the only metazoa that we're responsible for. So we already covered this. But what's the next logical step? The next logical step would be eumetazoa. And that's going to be many, many organisms. Um, everything except for sponges are eumetazoa, true tissue organisms. And of the eumetazoa, of focus now will be the ones who have radial symmetry, radiata, in other words. And of those who have radial symmetry, the one of key focus, the title really of this flowchart, would be the following. The phylum Cnidaria is what we're going to focus on for the rest of this flowchart. Cnidaria, one more time, have radial symmetry, they have true tissues, and they all came from an ancestral, single common ancestor protist called the coanoflagellate. We're not talking about these metazoans anymore. We covered them in the previous video. Let's talk about Cnidaria. Phylum Cnidaria consists of mostly marine organisms. So let's write that down. Mostly marine, that's the keyword here, organisms. So this would include, just to give you an idea of what kind of animals we're talking about, we're talking about jellyfish, we're talking about things like coral, we're talking about sea anemones. So anemone, I want to make sure I spell this right. Anemone, there we go. Sea anemones. So these are our marine organisms of phylum Cnidaria, just to give you uh, an idea of what they look like. We're all pretty much familiar with this, so now we've established this familiarity, what does this really consist of in terms of characteristics? What makes phylum Cnidaria, phylum Cnidaria? So let's look. Two key characteristics of focus are the fact that they have radial symmetry, which should be quite obvious because we started our flowchart with this ancestral protist that was a eumetazoan that has radiata, radial symmetry. So that's one key characteristic that all phylum Cnidaria have. And usually when you see radial symmetry, another key characteristic, something you can just automatically assume, is the fact that they were probably diploblastic. They only have two germ layers in their embryonic development, the endoderm and ectoderm, as established in our previous lecture. So those are two characteristics you can say all members of phylum Cnidaria definitely, definitely have. Now, in terms of body structure, we're going to now establish what makes phylum Cnidaria look the way it does. Why do we have these organisms grouped together? Their body structure plays a big role in that. First and foremost, the phylum Cnidaria uh, are, consists of a hollow sac-like structure. Um, that hollow sac will usually have a mouth to it, so it's with a mouth, and tentacles as well. So we all know that jellyfish have tentacles, and usually the mouth and tentacles are at one end. So a jellyfish's structure, right, uh, you have this basic head structure and then you have the tentacles, right? The tentacles are only at one end. They're not on this side, on this side, or everywhere. They're only at this one specific end. Same thing with the mouth. So the mouth and tentacles occupy one end of this hollow sac that I drew on the top. Very bad jellyfish here. Um, in addition, because we only have one end uh, of this organism, one-sidedness, let's say, I like to call phylum Cnidaria one-way organisms. And you'll see what I mean by that in just a second. One-way organisms. Now, those are my words, so I'm going to put those in quotes. One-way organisms. It's not the technical term, but I like to consider them this because they have a mouth. And the mouth is actually their only opening. 
and you already know exactly what I'm thinking about this. If this is their only opening, does that really mean they do what I think they do? Yes, it is. Yes, it does mean that. Food enters here. That's where food usually enters, right? Through the mouth. But guess what? Waste is also expelled through here. So a plus sign here would mean that waste is expelled here also. Let's write that as waste. Make that a little clearer. Waste expelled here also. Thus the term one-way organisms. Just one mouth, one opening. Thus you have to eat from there and you also have to expel waste from there. It's a very simple animal, okay? Moving forward, they also contain something known as a gastrovascular cavity. So let's write this down. That's the key here. It's a very defining characteristic. Gastrovascular cavity. So again, cavities play a big role in the kingdom Animalia. As we established previously with the sponges, they even have a cavity called the spongocele. Now in Cnidaria, still simple jellyfish, coral sea anemone, very simple organisms. Uh, they have a cavity known as the gastrovascular cavity. This is going to be their main cavity for digestion. Okay, It's just here, their digestion is a little bit more complex than just filter feeding. And specifically about their body structure, uh, one structure you should definitely know are the cnidocytes. And uh, as a point that I forgot to mention, this is not pronounced cnidaria or cnidaria. This is just pronounced cnidaria. It's a Greek word. The C is silent, actually, in this. So these are not cnidocytes, but cnidocytes. Cytes just refer to um, cells. And I spelled it wrong, so let me rewrite that. Cnidocytes. Cytes just means cells. And cells of who? Cells of those who are cnidarians, right? This is seen in figure 33.6. So take a look at this as we establish what this really means. Now, the thing I want you to notice is that we have specialization because these are specialized cells. And all animals have specialization. Thus, I have proved to you that cnidaria are absolutely no exception to that animal rule. So these are specialized cells. What do they do? They are specialized cells um, in the tentacles. Okay, They are within the tentacles of these organisms. And what is their major function? Think of a jellyfish. You usually don't want to get near these tentacles, right? You, everybody knows this. But why? That's because they possess cnidocytes. On their microscopic scale, they have tons and tons of cnidocytes on them that function in defense and prey capture. Defense plus prey capture. Why do they have to do this? Well, this is because they might get eaten by other animals because animals are heterotrophic or they need to eat. They need to capture prey because they themselves are heterotrophic. Key characteristic of all animals. And that's phylum cnidaria. Basic facts to remember about this. Uh, definitely understand the idea of radial symmetry, meaning that they're definitely diploblastic and these basic body structures, specifically the specialization that they exhibit in the form of cnidocytes.